Hello everyone and welcome to Arch Linux Conference 2020. All around the world we are facing challenging times. Like all this isn't enough, we are in the middle of a global pandemic as well. Today I would like to take the time and remind every one of us that we should focus on the good, not the bad. We shouldn't fight against something because we hate it. We should fight for something because we love it. For example, the Pandemic forced us to reevaluate Arch Linux conference and ultimately it led us to this online format, which is pretty awesome. I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to all our speakers, to everyone behind the curtain who made this conference possible, to our team members and distro contributors, as well as our awesome community. And of course, thank you for joining us here today. I hope you enjoy our talks. The first one of which we'll start off with is Arch Linux, the past, the present, and the future. Hi, everybody. This is Judd. Happy conference day. I'm very happy to see that Arch has grown into something bigger than any one of us. You know, when I, when I first started it many, many moons ago, it was always just to scratch my own itch, and it's one of the most joyous things that have ever happened to me, that the community has grown above and beyond any of my best expectations. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you guys today, but uh, I'm very happy it's happening. So all my best wishes, and enjoy the conference. Hi, this is Greg Crow Hartman, and welcome to ArchConf 2020. As a long-time Arch Linux user, I'm really happy to see this conference happen, even when we're all stuck at home. Thanks to all the Arch developers for maintaining such a great system that I rely on every day. Enjoy the conference. So I have about 15 minutes to give you a rough history of the 18 years of Arch Linux. So in the beginning, there was Crux, and it was good. Um, highlights being its simple package build scripts, simple configuration, utilities, um, but there was no dependency tracking. So the founder of Arch Linux, Judd, wrote Pac-Man and it essentially spawned a distribution. So beginning in 2002, Pac-Man 1.1 was released and then Arch Linux 0.1 codenamed Homer was released not far after. Good quote from the release notes is, the bad news is that you don't get a pretty interactive installer, so some things have not changed. Uh, the big selling points at the time were the i686 optimization, when most other distributions were using i386, and install once, continuously update, never have to reinstall policy, and it being simple. Now simple was defined in terms of the packaging and the tools for administrating the distribution, not in terms of being simple to use necessarily. Uh, there's some good quotes from Judd around that time, such as I've been told that Arch's documentation is less than perfect, so things improved there. And I would have to say that, yes, Arch is very suitable for servers. So the world was very optimistic back in 2003, probably pre-COVID. Um, our distribution releases used to have names, and some of these names are inventive and some are pretty boring. So point two, Vega. It came with an interactive installer. That was the ASCII graphical installer, I'll call it, and a utility called PackSync. Now this has gone to the ages, but I'm pretty sure that it was uh, supposed to automatically update your system without your intervention, so things we don't recommend anymore. Uh, mid to end of 2002, Pac-Man 2.0 came out, which finally managed dependencies, and the initial uh, script for the Arch build system, which would allow you to sync all the package build scripts. Um, and build your own packages, and Firefly was released. Um, a month later, Pac-Man 2.1 came out. This had resport, uh, support for multiple repositories, so packages got split into an unofficial repository and um, the main repository. 
Uh, there was the big move in October 2002 to GCC 3.2. That was the move from GCC 2.95 and was rather a big move. And so Arch Linux 0.4 named Dragon was released soon after. Um, with the release of Pac-Man 2.3 in 2003, uh, an unstable repository appeared. Um, that was used for mainly uh, beta releases and very, very testing sort of programs. Uh, big changes in the distribution were the adding PAM support in mid-2003. At that stage, PAM was rather experimental, so we were sticking on the bleeding edge of software usage. Um, and Arch Linux 0.5 Nova was released. Notably, a million package updates, according to the release notes. But we had PAM support, LVM support, Grub support, all added in that release. So we're starting to look a bit more like a Linux distribution we know. Uh, there was two ISOs released. One had 628 megabytes of packages, and one just had the base packages of 105 megabytes. So back in the day, one CD for the entire repos of Arch Linux. Uh, here goes all the other release names we had. Widget, Wombat, Noodle, Voodoo, Don't Panic, and Overlord. So in 2007 it was decided not to use version numbers anymore and stick with the date. Uh, that sort of continued on now. Except at that time releases were going to be made as each major kernel was released. So you had uh, the installer with the latest kernel on it. Um, that, that didn't last for long and eventually we moved to uh, more monthly releases. So there's been a lot of flux in the repositories and their names over the years. In November 2003 trusted user repositories became a thing. So my understanding was each trusted user had their own repository which they could put a bunch of packages in and um, people could pick and choose what they wanted. Uh, end of 2003 there was some renaming of the repositories. Stable uh, was called Release and later got renamed to Current. Uh, I'm not quite sure when that happened. I couldn't find that information but it just happened. Um, the unofficial repository turned into what we now know as the Extra Repository and in April 2004 the testing repository was added and the warning was these packages will be about as unstable as it gets in the testing repository. Um, slightly less unstable these days maybe. Uh, early on there was a lot of big software changes. I think in the early 2000s was when a lot of um, software was being developed and turning into what we currently know as Linux distributions. So X386 was replaced by Xorg, um, UDEV appeared, we got glibc which dropped support for very old Linux kernels, kernel 2.4 support in 2006. Um, you can see when all the wiki and forums and AUR opened, 2002 the forum opened, um, you can actually go back and read the original posts, they're still available in our forum, never been lost, and um, all easily searchable actually. Uh, 2004 the wiki was created, in 2005 we got the AUR. Uh, 2007 saw the um, start of the ArchDev public mailing list. Um, my understanding before that um, a lot of the development was handled either on IRC or on uh, private mailing list and so that's probably been lost to history there. Um, 2007 end of it we also got mailing lists, uh, these were renames but Arch General and AU uh, General got their current name. So 2007 saw a leadership change, Judd was booted out and Aaron came in as the leader. Uh, he stayed on as leader until 2020, so this year, where we changed how the project leaders were elected and made it into a two-year rolling position instead. Um, other repository shuffles that happened, 2007 was when our repos 
turned a lot like they are now. Um, core and extra were, became, so that was the current or um, became core and extra was already renamed. Uh, we got the base and bit based of our package groups created. Um, the base group has since became a meta package there. Um, in 2007 also was the declaration that all core packages must go through testing after a couple of nice incidents where systems stopped booting. Uh, 2007 we also had a logo competition where the current logo that we have was uh, created. So here goes a few of the historic Arch Linux logos. We started off with this sort of 0-1 ribbon style went into the Archer Space Force badge type style and, and currently we have the Archer design by Thayer Williams um, which won our competition. You can actually go back and see the other entries for that competition on the Arch website too. So summary of some of the big packaging changes that have happened over the years. Um, in 2008, man pages stopped being put in user man and all got used to user share man as dictated by the FHS. Uh, 2008, also docs were added to packages and that includes info pages. Uh, the policy until then was only to use man pages, only add them to packages and everything else could be found on the internet. Um, info pages was really the driving force to get docs added back to the packages and now we can treat info pages more like man pages when packaging. Uh, 2010 we switched to exec compression. Uh, also use bin Python got pointed to the Python 3 implementation as it should be. Uh, looking through the mailing list this was actually less controversial about among the developers than I remember. Um, pretty broadly supported. Uh, 2012 we saw the intro of systemd, uh, so systemd tools replaced udev then. Carry on through 2012 we got package signing enabled and also the lib directory became a symlink. Uh, end of 2012 systemd became the default and only supported in its system in Arch. 2013 we ended up moving the bin, sbin and user bin directories to become symlinks, simplifying the file system layout. Um, so the x8664 port was unofficial for many years, or for quite some time, and became unofficial in 2006. Uh, it didn't get any multi-lib support until 2011. It was actually officially supposed to be pure 64-bit until that stage. And in 2017 we said goodbye to i86. So when we started Arch, i8686 was uh, nicely optimized in one of the selling points. We really haven't moved on optimizing our binary since 2006 when the 64-bit uh, bit port was added. A bit about spin-offs. There was spin-offs in many architectures, so we've got uh, i586, PPC, Spark, MIPS and ARM. Uh, there was spin-off distros. The first one really started, well, first big spin-off was the KD Mod repo, which hosted, at the time, KDE was a big monolithic package where you got pretty much everything in one big package. Uh, the KD Mod team split it up into lots of sub packages and actually designed what would now become our package splitting. Um, this turned into Chakra into 2010. Since then there's been many other distros and distrolets added. There's also been spin-offs such as Arch Stable which was supposed to be for server usage and supposed to be more point release distribution. Arch BSD, a BSD port of Arch Linux, a herd port of Arch Linux, um, which I think is still currently available and bootable. Uh, other fun observations I had from going through all the archives of mailing lists um, were there was at least three newsletter variants and an e-zine over the years. Uh, there was a bunch of attempts at automated security monitoring, uh, automatic package building, distributed package building that all fell to the uh, wayside. 
So it's good our security team currently is in a more established position. Uh, lots of debates over which C flags and LD flags we should use while packaging, both for security and optimization pur uh, purposes. Um, in 2008, you could read about the debate of choosing SVN over Git for managing our package scripts. Turns out SVN was chosen because we didn't need all the power of Git and SVN did the job quite nicely at the time. Uh, another thing you can find on the mailing list is lessons about not doing a control C in the middle of an update on a remote server that hosts most of the Arch infrastructure. Luckily someone was available to fix that. And with that quick summary of Arch history I'll hand over so we can hear a bit more about what's going to happen in the future. Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of Arch Linux past, present and future. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the future. But before we do that, a small disclaimer. So basically, um, this is just a view into, the po into a possible future. The future has not been written yet, as we know. So everything is possible and um, not everything I present here um, has been finally decided. So it's basically a mix of uh, general consensus and personal ideas. Um, so take the information like that. Uh, first, let's uh, look a little bit at the agenda. So we're going to talk a little bit about our culture because um, this is uh, very important for our future. Um, and also we're going to have a small insight into the concepts of change. And then we get a little bit technical by discussing how we regain some of our lost excellence and also uh, talk a little bit about future improvements. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Leventa Poyak. And I'm a, a full stack software and security engineer and also love doing DevOps duties. Um, I joined Arch in um, 2014 as part of the security team. And today I'm also involved in packaging and development and um, also in DevOps work. Um, I've been elected as the current Arch Linux project leader in 2020. So let's focus on one of the uh, one of the very important aspects of our distro, which is our culture itself. Um, this basically, we should a little bit think about how, how we should approach things to succeed. Um, this is a very fundamental part of our distribution after all, because we are people and not just technology. Um, so what I mean by that is, we should also look a little bit into our team spirit and how we can extend and um, expand our current team spirit. Um, at the end, working together is always more efficient and also more fault tolerant. Uh, so sometimes there were some ideas of having package teams or um, some core teams which are responsible for a certain aspect of uh, or a certain subset of packages. Um, but I think because a little bit of our nature, it more went in a direction that we have uh, package maintainers maintaining software they're actually interested in, um, which is totally good. So this, I believe, not something we need to change. Um, but what I want to talk about when it comes to our culture related to that topic is, and there has been some trend lately, which I really like, uh, uh, which I really like, and want to see it being extended, is that we stop seeing packages as my package or thinking in terms like that, because at the end uh, we are all serving Arch, and uh, being a package maintainer is just a duty. Um, what what I mean by that is we should extend co-maintaining packages, um, having it a little bit more team effort, like having two or three maintainers for complex packages or yeah, something like that. Um, this is a good idea because we reduce bus factor by that. And um, I still believe it's very important that we have certain dedicated people attached to a package because domain knowledge, especially for complex packages, is always very important. And you lose domain knowledge if you just share it across everyone. 
Um, so I think we are doing fine. We should just improve the team spirit of having co-maintainers. This is actually, I think, very beneficial for our distro. Um, another part of our culture is uh, communication, because as I mentioned earlier, we are all humans, and uh, the human part of our distro, even through we are technology, um, is very important because we, the people, are who creates the technology, who maintains the technology. And it is super important that we maintain nonviolent communication and extend also in this area. Um, it's super important that we are all always friendly and excellent to each other. This, this, this should be normal, but sometimes it's not as easy as that. Uh, especially in tech, uh, sometimes it leads to heated discussions. Um, I believe one reason for that is because we are dealing with a lot of text, which also lacks some side channels like emotions, voice, and also facial, facial expressions. Um, so if we take in, that into account, we should always know that there are different ways how to interpret text. And if we do so, we should, at the or the most important factor here is also that we expect the others don't being evil-minded, even if it feels like being a heated discussion. I think nobody wants to hurt uh, someone else. It's it's not about that. Um, it's that we have some needs, some 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 topics that are important for us, and we want to get a point straight and. Um, so always, always try to think it like that. On the other hand, contrary to that, always try to write texts and yeah, follow a discussion in a way that it is le less likely to be misinterpreted. Uh, at the end, we are all volunteers and we want to solve problems. And we have our opinions, which is a totally good thing, um, but we we sh should keep it to, to technical facts and opinions, and we shouldn't discourage some, some, um, some contributors. Or this, this has bad influence, and uh, we should focus on the great parts here. Nobody is evil-minded, and we should always keep that in mind and uh, don't discourage work, uh, free work. Uh, so uh, the last part about our culture is improve openness. Um, what I mean by that is that we make it a little bit easier or a little bit more modern for external contributors to join and help uh, help maintaining and improving art. Um, we'll also talk about that a little bit later, but um, one central part would be like the interaction with patches and things like that. I, I believe we can improve it. And this is actually not very far future. So we will talk about that shortly. Mm. So the second part now is talking a little bit about the concept of change. Uh, this a little bit goes hand in hand with culture, actually. Um, we, we, we should have a different mindset about change in, in general. It, it, I feel like there is often a little bit of fear in Wolf when, when change comes into mind. Um, so always be open-minded about change. Change should be about reanalyzing something and about concluding and deciding based on current facts and the current state. Um, so we should keep it at a rational level. Uh, it, it, it will also make us more flexible and more adaptable. Uh, we should also treat it as something positive. So there is nothing negative in change. Um, the world around us and te technology in general is always changing and evolving. And we, we can't change, or we, we, we can't, well, that, that's just the fundamental nature. And this is actually good because we also want to evolve. Um, it basically can mean two different things. Either we are adapting to a new situation or we are, or it's just part of evolution itself. Uh, and, and so we, sh we should treat change really as something positive. It's not something negative. It also doesn't mean if we change some aspects that it invalidates the past. This is absolutely not the case. Um, there is nothing bad about change as we, as I mentioned right now, it's just either uh, adapting to something or generally evolving. Um, 
task. And also, success in the past doesn't guarantee success in the future. This is also very important to take into account. And at the very last, um, change also doesn't invalidate or disrespect the past. It can be totally great the way we have been doing things um, that led us to today, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't reconsider some aspects. And this is why I just urge that we are always open-minded about change because this will bring us forward. Um, so now let's get a little bit technical because I believe this is also one of the reasons a lot of people are watching this talk or this part of the talk now, because they want to hear about actual changes. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, the first thing I would like to talk about is a little bit regain lost excellence. Um, what I mean by that is, um, well, we have an 80 years ongoing journey and some of our excellence, um, well, we, we lost it, kind of. So let's talk about the first topic, which is optimized architectures. Back then, we basically were optimized, or we were having optimized architectures because we were very in a very early stage, already providing um, a new set um, of, of optimized packages, architecturally optimized packages. Uh, we lost this excellence because we stopped evolving on that aspect and we just stayed to what we introduced back then uh, for a very long period of time, actually. This is also because we have some technical challenges we need to tackle before we are able to, to have further or yeah, further optimized architectures or also potentially more architectures in general. But this is something we lost somewhere on our journey and we should think about gaining or, or regaining this excellence. Um, so it could be the repositories with subset of optimized packages or in, in general have mo more optimized architectures for all packages. This is not something we decided yet, but I think we are all agreeing on that we want to have this. So at one point when we have some some Yes, or we solved some of the challenges we are aware of that are holding us a little bit back. We should really have an open discussion about how we regain this part. Um, actually, right now it's not too far in the future because we have a lot of changes made, especially lately, that will help us to regain this. Uh, another aspect uh, I want to talk about is modernizing package sources. Um, we are still using SVN to maintain our sources, um, our PKG builds, which are basically the description about how to build packages. And this is a bit cumbersome in some aspects to deal with it. Also, it is not very open if we think about, uh, we, we talked about openness uh, in the first slides. Um, it makes it hard to contribute right now when it comes also to packages. Some people try to create diffs and patch files and append it to bug tracker and things like that. But this is not really streamlined and this is not really a great process for uh, uh, contrib uh, contributors overall. And also not for us as team members to deal with all this. I think this is pretty much established uh, uh, consensus. So we are actually in the middle of uh, having a transition. We're working on um, having the migration ready, including the full history and everything related to it, um, as well as changing some of our infrastructure and uh, about our tooling um, that will allow us to get there. So Git sources are actually very near future and we will get that hopefully very soon. There are just some tiny details we need to figure out and solve. The third part I want to talk about here is signed repo databases. This is not actually something we lost because we didn't ever have signed repo databases, but the world around us changed a little bit and signed repo databases, um, repository I mean, um, where we are pulling software and packages out of, is de facto standard today in, across major distros. So we should really have that as well. Um, I've been working on some proof of concept also with help of others and also with the help of DevOps uh, looking into how we can have a bare bone, very secure locked up servers. 
Um, so we will have some discussions about that um, because we tr still try to, yeah, I mean, people had concerns and we, we shouldn't just invalidate it, but we should take it into account. So the current proof of concept we were working with so far uh, took the concerns into account. And I think there were some nice solutions we could tackle this topic. Um, so we will raise some discuss discussions about that shortly and hopefully also gain some data, uh, repo databases in a near future. Um, this also has a little bit to do with uh, Git migration. But we will come to that when we are actually discussing this topic in the future. So now let's talk about actual future improvements. Uh, one major thing I want to talk about, and this is also the first bullet point, is accelerate delayed package updates. What I mean by that is time, timely package updates are our core value. We are a rolling distro and users are expect that our packages are always up to date and we are rolling fast. This is really our core value. Um, now, some of you may ask why we need to accelerate and what I mean by that. The only thing I mean by that is that right now we don't really have a central way of detecting upstream updates. Uh, so basically, it's a per package maintainer effort to somehow keep track of upstream sources. Um, in some areas, it works great. In some areas, it actually doesn't work out that well. And um, sometimes it takes weeks or months and multiple releases until a user flags uh, a package as out of date in, on, on ArchWeb. And then we finally roll an update because a package maintainer was not really aware maybe of that. And I don't think this is a people problem, so we should not start yelling at people why are not properly keeping track. But I think this is more like a tooling problem. We should solve it with technology. So I've been also lately playing around and toying with something we call um, ourselves send crawler. Uh, so this is also something I will raise in the future, having something technologically integrated in ArchWeb, which is able to automatically flag packages as, as out of date. And this will also accelerate at the end um, delayed package updates. This is one of our core responsibilities. Second, and this is a new topic I want to talk about, is integrate reproducible builds. Um, we have been really doing great achievements in this topic and the topic of reproducible builds. Um, there will also be a talk of a talk of uh, Morton, um, the state of reproducible builds, if you're more interested in that topic. Um, but it is basically a part of uh, supply chain security that we validate that, um, just to phrase it maybe in one in single sentence, that we validate that released packages are and can't be backdoored because uh, you always build the very same thing from uh, the sources uh, we are um, committing and maintaining. Uh, so there could be no sneaky patch, invisible ninja patch, which implements a backdoor or something like that. Uh, this would be detected. And um, integrate, uh, and the integration part, I mean, better integration into ArchWeb uh, in terms of icons, in terms of API, and finally also user-facing tools. Users should be able to query the state of their system related to reproducible packages. And maybe in a very far future, we could also dream about something that reproducible packages should be the standard and people should be able somehow to tell um, I only want reproducible packages and not install non-reproducible packages. Of course, this is very far future and we need to solve a lot of problems um, that we are facing if we want to achieve that. But this is still a dream we should think about for a future. Um, and the third topic is implement single sign-on. This is actually a very near future because we are already working very hard on it and uh, we are also testing it. and. Uh, for team members, this is already present. We just need to integrate it in all our different services a little bit better. Um, it also helps a little bit in terms of community openness. And we will also have uh, external login providers, which helps a little bit um, 
well, to eliminate some kind of annoying factors. And it also simplifies from our team perspective the on and off boarding and is less error prone. And it's just something great to have. So we're very near on having that. Um, and the third and final topic I want to talk about is a little bit of consolidating detached areas. Um, so we currently have already GitLab and uh, we are moving some or most of our projects to GitLab. Um, we need to solve some problems first and also be able to open up uh, uh, the single sign-on platform, which allows um, to use GitLab also for external contributors. But then, and this is something I personally really would like to see is, we should think about consolidating all our fragmented tools, basically our Kanban boards, um, our bug tracker, and uh, yes, yeah, things like that. Um, for some parts, like the Kanban board, we already have a consensus, but not for every single aspect. So there will be some discussions, um, but I personally would really love to see it integrated into one platform, because then we gain a lot in, in having it at the central place, um, especially when it also comes to packages, um, package sources, PKG builds and bugs related to it. It's very easy then to deal with everything and have cross references um, in terms of issues and sources and merge requests and also Kanban boards about some epics and things like that. Um, I, be I believe GitLab is there really a nice uh, a true tool that will help us to streamline some of our fragmented uh, areas. Um, so we should have a discussion and see how we can extend this platform or how we want to use this platform in the future. So let's see. Um, but more about that in Sven's talk, um, Architecture at Arch, uh, which should be the one next to this talk. So join in and listen to him. And the final words I want to say thank you all. Thanks to the community. You're actually what Arch, um, well, Arch wouldn't be where it is today uh, if you, we wouldn't have you. So. We are very happy about our community and we are also inviting you all to take a look into maybe how you can get involved or how you want personally to get involved if you feel like uh, you want to do that. And there's this wiki link you can follow. It gives a little bit of explanation uh, about the different aspects and the different parts where you could get involved and start um, helping Arch more to stay what it is and to evolve even further. So a big thanks to our community as well. Hope you enjoyed the talk and now we can, yeah, go over to a little bit of Q and A. Thanks all. And welcome to the first live segment uh, of the ArchLinux Q and of ArchLinux conference. So I'm here with um, uh, Leventa. Anthrax, the project leader, and then Alan McRae, which had to teach me how to pronounce the name. Um, so I think we'll just kick off with questions. Um, so the first question that was sort of uh, arrived was, uh, what are info pages from uh, Verst? If anybody wants to explain. Oh, so info pages are like man pages, but a bit more verbose. Um, again, for access mainly via command line. So uh, a lot of new projects like GCC have big info pages and not very much man pages. And so that was the drive to get them back into our packages. Yes, interesting. Uh, and so another question from March, March, uh, March the 12th, uh, will there be another split in repos? Uh, event uh, probably? Uh, I'm not totally sure what split in repos is meant here. Uh, I'm um, suspecting maybe core because extra of the optimized. Community. Yeah, optimized as well, maybe. Well, it, it, for optimized architectures, it basically depends on a decision uh, which way we want to support optimized architectures. So mm. this is not something we could answer right now. Um, but besides having optimized architectures, I don't really think it would make sense to split it even further. Um, yeah. So yeah. nice. Uh, 
problem for Alan. Uh, where does the name Arch Linux come from? From Secret. Oh, so Arch is from Arch Enemy. Um, I'm not sure why it was chosen, but uh, that's what Judd came up with. I recall reading about Primary as well being um, part of the reasoning. So for Anthrax, yeah. uh, from Post Factum, uh, what I don't understand is SVN choice. Why? Why the SVN choice? So back then it was basically not that widespread compared to today, because today it's, well, I guess the most used uh, version control system. And also in the developer and uh, technical community, uh, it's very well known. Um, uh, so I guess the decision basically was because it was uh, not that known back then, not that widespread, and it was just simpler to use. Uh, this was why it has been decided like that uh, in the past, which is totally fine because it made sense back then. Um, but as I also explained, uh, today times changed a little bit, and uh, that's why we are now um, in the transition to JIT. Um, so there's been a few questions uh, about Arch Linux uh, ARM. Um, so March the 12th asks, will there be an official ARM port uh, if it gets uh, popular, like uh, if it gets more, if ARM gets more popular? And another question is, well, what? how about Arch Linux ARM into the Arch Linux fold? Third question is also, why is Alarm not more tightly integrated into Arch, which all ties, to get, ties together? Um, Okay, so I think the ARM architecture is pretty popular. Um, so some of the reasons why was um, having to have kernels for specific um, machines. It wasn't so easy as just I686 and you provided a single kernel. There was a lot of different architectures to choose from, so what support. Also, the Alarm people, they do an awesome job. They've got a good infrastructure. They've set it up quite nicely. So, um, you know, they're doing their thing very well. So there's not much point us replicating it. So the question would be more, will they merge with us at some stage? And the topic's been broached a few times. I think us not using Git for our package management is a big blocking point because they use it for theirs. Um, so, there's potential, but there's there's a lot of factors in the background of sponsorship of machines and everything that they get with their branding and, and how that would work if they merged in with us. So a lot of issues to be sorted, mm -hmm. and they're doing very well without us. So we can let them continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about Felix uh, actually? was asking what we what we're thinking about with the risk five um i know felix has been working on it but what are your thoughts well i have no thoughts on risk five <laughs> um hadn't considered it so uh, I, I i think basically it will boil down to how much interest inside our community or inside of new volunteers um related to risk five uh, appears because at the end, it, it is not enough to have just a small, tiny portion of people being interested in, in maintaining it. Because maintaining a new architecture um, will also gives us a lot of work uh, in terms of support and uh, other challenges related to different architectures. Uh, but so I guess there is no clear answer yet because there was no discussion about it. But I'm inviting to start this discussion, and we will see where we go. Yeah, yeah. I'll also point out the 64-bit architecture started out as a community-driven project, and then got, when it got popular, got moved into Arch. Mm -hmm. So there is past there, because there's been many, many different architecture ports of Arch that have fallen along the wayside over the years. So, you know, when it gets big enough, maybe. Um, so, uh, we also have a question about diversity in Arch, um, probably for Leventa. Uh, how's the diversity of the people in charge of Arch? Um, I, I, I would say this could be improved, but basically it depends on people who are interested in doing work. Um, 
So if, if you just look at uh, the pure stuff right now, um, it is not very diverse. Uh, I, I'm personally not really sure what the reason for that is, but we would love to see it um, yeah, being a bit more colorful. Mm -hmm. um, so Nice. Um, so I'll just skip a few questions from uh, uh, from the audience because we not, don't have that much time left. Um, we can take one of the more CPU questions which has been going on, but uh, what's the current state of the discussion regarding dropping support for old CPUs? Uh, what would be cut off? Uh, at the time, not that uh, CPUs were being considered as too old. And at the same time, I have a Core 2 Duo that's perfectly fine as a headless in box, uh, which was is asked by Malaco. So CPU optimizations, architectures and stuff, Alan? Yeah, I suppose this came from me trying to push some more optimizations into packages <laughs> maybe a year ago now. Mm. Um, so I think the, the discussion's more focused around providing additional architectures rather than dropping support. But I will note back in I686 days, we had what was it, Fire C3s that had almost I686 support and often failed when an optimization landed in a package. Mm. And we just said tough. So I, I think it's a decision that will be discussed as we work towards more um, optimized architectures, whether we continue supporting plain X864. I assume we would. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so for uh, Leventa, uh, currently where is Arch Linux lacking uh, in volunteer power? Uh, this is also asked by Lurst. Uh, so so this opinion or this personal opinion I have for quite a long time. Um, so I, I think we really could extend the area of uh, having people using testing and giving more feedback for our testing repositories. I think we are very much lacking uh, um, volunteer power there um, to do it uh, better than we are doing today. Uh, it works for some packages, more like core packages, and that are not that much of a problem but we also want to be able to use testing for uh, community packages and not so critical parts of the system, which in my opinion is not very well tested. So this could be one thing uh, we, we really search for new volunteers who help us uh, use testing and give real feedback to it. Um, but in general, <clears throat> basically in every area, it depends on just people who want to involve time. Uh, we are happily inviting people to join and help us. Um, of course, I wouldn't say we have any area where we totally need absolutely no volunteer power at all. So just look up what you like and help us. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want one area, then help us in testing. Uh, so time for one more quick question. Um, how does Arch plan continually succeeding as a major distribution going forward? Either Elm or Leventa. Uh, I guess this is a tough question to answer because I, how how I mean this is a little bit what I talked in the future part. We should just look over and over again at our excellence and see if we can still held it up until today, and if not, how we adapt to new situation or where we see areas where we want to just evolve a little bit further. Mm. Um, so I, I couldn't pinpoint one thing on how to do it, but we should just be open and go with the time. And yeah, this, this plays a little bit hand in hand with uh, uh, regaining some stuff that we lost and also looking into more future proof platforms for contribution. Um, but this is also something Sven will be talking about in the next talk a little bit. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would say just be open and look at the current state more often. Yes. Uh, so that's uh, all we managed to get in uh, on the Q&A session. Uh, super many thanks to Elm for answering questions and Leventa. Um, and then we'll go over to the next talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.